Great. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, lo really looking forward to this uh, conversation with uh, David and Kristen. My name is Steve Call, and I am the uh, president of the New America Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you today and also to moderate our discussion. Um, just before we get started, some quick housekeeping notes. This would be a good time to silence whatever noise-making devices you have. Uh, we are on the record today, and you can tell that we're uh, broadcasting or recording uh, both. Voice of America is here, and uh, we're doing some webcasting. So when we turn to the audience for questions, the point is just please wait for the microphone, speak briefly and clearly, um, and uh, if possible, identify yourself uh, as you ask your question. Um, I'm going to ask David and uh, Kristen to make some introductory remarks about their experience. I think David and Kristen are now a week into the hell that is book touring. They've been uh, on television and radio. You may have heard them on Diane Rehm or NPR or seen them on the broadcast networks last night. They were at Politics and Prose and did some reading from the book. And uh, I think we're going to try to take today's conversation and push it a little bit into the substance of the uh, regional studies that David in involuntarily undertook himself and that uh, uh, Kristen educated herself in so uh, courageously over the course of this uh, story um, and really talk not just about what they went through, and I don't want to neglect that, but also try to look for insight into it. Uh, as uh, David himself, I think, has charmingly said, this is one of the great involuntary embeds in the Haqqani network. Um, and uh, he has, I think, in a very admirable way, uh, thought of it as a journalist uh, throughout. Uh, I've not seen anyone uh, in any circumstance go through something like what uh, David has gone through. But what I have admired most about the way he's dealt with it in public afterwards is that he has uh, stayed true to his profession. And as he did at a an event we had here just a few weeks ago offered dispassionate and penetrating and empirical insights about uh, matters that would test the resolve of uh, all of the rest of us and done so uh, without ever yielding his uh, values as a journalist. Uh, Kristen, I know less well but admire through the book, which I've read uh, from cover to cover, I found it in the world of endorsing and reading books for, for professional acquaintances, one of the easiest uh, of assignments because once I picked it up I just was compelled to read it all the way through. I'm sure many of you will have the same experience and I urge you to uh, read it quite sincerely because it's really difficult to describe what they've achieved here. It is a uh, very compelling story, very personal, it, it's very accessible, uh, but it is never maudlin or um, manipulative and it's very clean and straightforward and it's full of information and uh, for reasons that are obvious and um, in many ways unfortunate, it tells a story that most of us will never have reason to experience. It takes us into spaces and into institutions and processes uh, that most of us would only discover through Hollywood in the most unreliable of ways. And, and it becomes, I think, a source of, of real education, um, not just about the Afghan-Pakistan border, but about our own government and about the way the world works um, in the context of the Afghan war. So I'm very pleased to be the host today. Uh, David, besides the co-authoring this book, uh, has been at the New York Times since 1996. Uh, he escaped from his imprisonment by the Haqqanis uh, in June of 2009, so we're about uh, approaching his 18th month anniversary. Um, he was part of the Times reporting team that won the 2009 and fully deserved Pulitzer for its coverage of both Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, and he has previous experience of war coverage in many theaters, most notably in the Balkans, where he served as a correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor. And he wrote a book that I've also read and admired enormously. And if you haven't read it, and you're here today, that means you have an interest in his work, so go on Amazon and buy the paperback. Mm -hmm. It's called Endgame, The Betrayal and Fall of Srebrenica, uh, a story that he reported from the ground, uh, was in fact detained by another faction in that war, but uh, for 
much less time. And uh, the work he did in the field about what happened at Srebrenica uh, took 10 or 15 years for the criminal court at The Hague to catch up with it, but eventually uh, much of that has now been documented. Uh, Kristen and David married about two months before he was kidnapped, uh, and she's a journalist and uh, a writer and a uh, photography director in her own right in New York and has worked at a variety of magazines, Marie Claire Self, Cosmopolitan, and she also paints and illustrates. And her voice comes through uh, in the book, I think, fully the equal of David's and very strong, very powerful. And I look forward to hearing more from you both. Uh, so why don't the two of you each do your uh, thing that by now must be reasonably well practiced, and then I'll ask you a few questions, and then we'll turn to the audience. We only have one microphone uh, today, well, so you'll we'll, have to share. We'll do this okay. at first. Um, thank you, um, Steve. It was very kind uh, introduction, and he's been a great supporter of this book and, and of us, and we thank you so much for having this uh, event here today. Um, I'm going to talk more about the empirical evidence that um, Steve noticed. It's thrilling to actually hear those words um, and try to talk in, in more detail. Um, everything I'm describing is in the book, but I want to, um, you know, lay it out here. And it will be, you know, my experience with the Haqqanis, kind of how I saw them operate in Afghanistan and then in Pakistan. And I am just basically trying to deliver information here, uh, what I saw firsthand um, there's, you know, you can, many things you could debate about what it means, but, um, you know, I can deal with that more in, in a, the questions period. And we'll each try to keep these initial talks pretty short. We want you to drive this conversation and, and ask about the topics that interest you. Um, I was uh, uh, kidnapped um, in uh, outside of Kabul in Logar province. We were just south of Puli Alam. Uh, the commander um, I thought I was going to meet um, was described to me as a moderate Taliban. I had no idea he had any ties to the Haqqani network. Uh, he had done interviews with two other foreign journalists um, and not kidnapped them. I met with one of those journalists, um, and they said it is more dangerous for you as an American, but I don't think he'll kidnap you. Um, it's not clear when the Haqqanis... Um, exactly became involved. They may have been involved from the beginning, but um, we drove to the interview in Logar and were kidnapped. And on the second day of our captivity, Badruddin Haqqani, the younger brother of Siraj Haqqani, was calling the New York Times Bureau and making demands for ransom at that point. So they were definitely involved within 48 hours, if not involved from the beginning. And what was amazing was how quickly and effectively the Haqqanis moved me across eastern Afghanistan. Um, I wouldn't have done this kind of interview in Pakistan and I was amazed to see uh, we were moved from district to district by different Haqqani commanders. Uh, I was in the back of a station wagon with a couple motorbikes accompanying us. And each district, a different uh, Haqqani commander would sort of meet us and escort us through the district. Uh, and we were moved uh, from Wardak uh, through Ghazni, uh, through Paktia, and then finally Paktika. Um, I didn't know at the time where we were. Um, I was being told we were driving to southern Afghanistan. And at one point, uh, they stopped the car uh, at night and announced that we had to walk through the mountains because there was a large American military base blocking the way ahead of us. Um, we spent the next nine hours walking through the mountains. Um, and when we arrived on the other side in the morning, uh, we were in Pakistan. Uh, we had crossed from Paktika to South Waziristan. Uh, I realized we were in South Waziristan when I saw a road sign in Urdu and then separately a roadside in English for Wana, and we drove through the center of Wana, South Waziristan, a town I had visited um, a couple years earlier with the Pakistani military. Um, we then drove on the main uh, paved highway from Wana up to Miran Shah in North Waziristan. All along the road, the Pakistani government checkpoints had been abandoned. Um, they were manned instead by young Taliban gunmen. Um, our Haqqani uh, network uh, driver had passwords that he had to give at each, each checkpoint. Um, and again, there was no evidence of Pakistani government control. Once we arrived in Miran Shah, the town itself uh, appeared to be completely under um, Haqqani control. Uh, Pakistani forces essentially stayed on their bases. Um, in, the, in the houses where we were held captive, there were radio towers set up on the roofs. And I, I spent a great deal of time with Badr and Haqqani. Um, he had his own sort of ICOM walkie-talkie that he would use with these relay towers to communicate with his men throughout town. Um, he would often walk around town. He would walk to the houses we were in and, again, uh, felt very secure. Um, they were very confident uh, to the point where 10 days into the kidnapping, uh, 
they had me call my wife on a Thuraya cell phone, which I think they were well aware could be tracked by American officials and make their initial demands. Um, and one small thing, and this may be getting down in the weeds, but it was fascinating to me. In one of my first conversations with Badruddin, he made a point of trying to tell me that the Haqqani network um, was underneath and very much respected the, the authority of Mullah Omar. Um, he sat me down and tried to say that the American uh, military spreads these stories that the Haqqanis work independently of Mullah Omar, but it was very important for him that I realized they were uh, uh, obeying the Amir al -Mumineen. Um The second point he needed and wanted to repeatedly make was to hide the fact that we were in Pakistan. Um, later on in the captivity, um, he decided he wanted to make a video um, to try to increase the pressure um, on my family. And so uh, he drove us for three hours across uh, North Waziristan to a remote uh, mountainside, which was covered in snow. And then we essentially staged a video where I was ordered to say that I was walking through the mountains um, in Afghanistan. The conditions were terrible, um, and I was, I, was, I was very, very sick. Uh, during that walk, I again saw that checkpoints were all abandoned. Uh, I did see some Frontier Corps soldiers standing at the checkpoints, uh, but they, uh, they were disarmed. Um, they would be basically chatting with local Taliban but didn't appear to be in control of them. And I described this anecdote in the story I wrote for the New York Times. Um, we ran into a Pakistani Army resupply convoy during the drive to that uh, snow video shoot. And um, uh, Badrin and Haqqani um, pulled over to the side of the road when we saw the Pakistani Army forces. Um, the Pakistani soldiers were very nervous. They, they clearly did fear an attack, uh, particularly a suicide bombing. There was a soldier who jumped out of the lead truck and pointed a rocket-propelled grenade at our car and a car that was in front of us to, and motioned us to pull to the side of the road. Um, I thought maybe there was a chance we'd be rescued, that the, the Pakistani army might come look in our car. Um, instead, they simply drove by. Uh, Badruddin stepped out of the driver's seat and sort of waved to the Pakistani soldiers as they went by. Um, he got back in the car and explained to me that under the peace agreement between the Taliban and the Pakistani army, um, when a Pakistani army convoy came through, uh, civilian vehicles like the one in front of us had to pull over and everyone had to get out of the car. But Taliban vehicles had to pull over to the side of the road, but only the Taliban, uh, the driver, had to get out. Um, that allowed them to sort of hide us from the Pakistani army and, and obviously hide foreign militants. Uh, separately, there were, um, my guards talked about, uh, and they took classes from uh, Uzbek militants in Miran Shah. They taught them how to make roadside bombs. Uh, two of them would stay with us and two would go off and go to bomb-making class. Uh, large explosions would go off in the middle of Miran Shah, and I never saw Pakistani forces coming off the bases there to investigate anything. Uh, lastly, um, the Haqqanis clearly, you know, drone strikes and drones were a constant presence in Waziristan. Uh, they did kill senior uh, Haqqani members and, and senior Pakistani Taliban as well, and they, did, they definitely feared them. They decided at some point in my captivity that the American government was trying to kill me uh, with a drone strike, and to avoid that happening, they moved me in March from uh, uh, Miran Shah, North Waziristan, down to McKean, South Waziristan. Um, you, some of you, and, and I, some of you are former colleagues here, are Pakistani journalists who know the region better than I do. Um, we were very worried about the move to McKean, South Waziristan, because that is the stronghold of, of the former Pakistani Taliban leader, Baitullah Massoud. And we thought that the Pakistanis had potentially sold, I'm sorry, that the Haqqanis had sold us to Baitullah Massoud, in other words, that the Afghan Taliban were selling us to the Pakistani Taliban. Instead, there was seamless coordination. Uh, we went to um, McKean, and uh, Baitullah's forces provided us with an empty house to live in, uh, and then we moved into the house with our same Haqqani guards, and the two groups uh, cooperated with each other well. Uh, we were later moved out of that area um, five to six weeks later, and again, we feared that Baitullah's people might try to grab us I was, again, seen as this very valuable hostage, but that did not happen. There seemed to be you know, total coordination and, and respect for each other's authority between Baitullah, Masood, and the Haqqanis. Um, lastly, in the last house we were held in, in, in Miran Shah, uh, there were rumors at one point that the Pakistani army was going to mount an offensive and try to retake control of Miran Shah. Um, my guards, who were all Afghan Taliban, got very excited. They were very very excited to fight the Pakistani army. I, I had There was tremendous um, anger and disdain among the Haqqani foot soldiers towards the Pakistani army. Um, but then a radio command uh, the next day was issued, and it ordered that all of the Afghan Taliban 
uh, if there was a Pakistani operation, were not to fight the Pakistani army. Uh, the Pakistani Taliban would fight the Pakistani army if they tried to take control of Miran Shah. Um, we were able to escape in late June uh, because, primarily because our captors uh, were so confident about their control of Miran Shah that they moved us into a house that was only three-tenths of a mile from the uh, Pakistani army base uh, or the scout base in Miran Shah. Um, after we reached the base, um, we were interviewed by um, first a Pakistani, he seemed to be a military intelligence officer, he didn't seem to be ISI. Um, his questions focused entirely on our, our time in McKean and focused entirely on Baitullah Massoud. He really didn't have much interest in hearing about the Haqqanis. Uh, and then we were eventually uh, flown out of the region by the Pakistani military. Um, in terms of what the Haqqanis wanted, and this is just my last point, um, they seem to be very interested in direct talks with the United <coughs> States government, and there was a sense of wanting to be respected by them, and um, they, they seem to want to make my case to force uh, the Americans to talk to them directly. That did not happen, and, and instead, unfortunately, all of this fell to my wife, uh, and who was ably assisted my newspaper, the New York Times, was fantastic, and Kristen will now tell you about her side of this experience. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I have to set the stage for this. Our worlds couldn't have been more different. I had been working in women's magazines for almost 20 years. And um, prior to the kidnapping, I had started a new job two weeks before as the photography director at Cosmopolitan Magazine. Um, fortunately, I hadn't switched my maiden name, so the Taliban was not able to Google me and find out what I did for a living. <laughs> um, it was something I worried about throughout the case uh, because they did Google my brother-in-law, Lee, who worked very closely with us on the case, and um, he was part of a small aviation company of four people, um, but the Taliban insisted that he manufactured jumbo jets, and couldn't he sell a jumbo jet, and, and we could pay for David to get him out that way. Um, anyway, so I found out at my office um, from my brother-in-law, he'd actually been alerted by the FBI uh, that David had gone to a Taliban interview and didn't return. Um, right away, I, you know, I was thrown into this kind of shadow world and a world I knew very little about. Um, I had been to Pakistan once during our courtship. We'd gone to Lahore, and um, I was thankful to have had that experience. Uh, you know, it reconfirmed for me that, you know, there were wonderful people in Pakistan. Um, militancy was the exception and not the norm. Um, very quickly, the FBI swooped in, um, told me they were the lead agency on the case, they trained me how to take phone calls um, in the event that David or his captors would phone us at home, um, which they did. Um, I was instructed to drag out the calls, um, to ask how they were doing, to appear to be compliant but never make specific commitments. Um, I received a call from my husband about a week into the captivity. Prior to that, the kidnappers had been calling the New York Times office in Kabul, and the reporters there were tremendous throughout. Um, early on, the reporters were trying to make the case that David was a journalist. It was wrong to hold him, and uh, it didn't seem like the Haqqanis were going to be shamed into releasing him. Um, I met with, I think on day two, it was all a whirlwind, I met with David's editors at the New York Times and Bill Keller and Arthur Sulzberger uh, and the legal counsel. And um, I stated, uh, as our entire family um, wanted the case to remain private. And I know for them it went against every instinct as journalists. Um, there was somewhat of a precedent for this. Melissa Fung had been kidnapped prior to my husband. In fact, she was freed the day before he was kidnapped. Um, and her case had stayed out of the press. So there was somewhat of a precedent for it. Um, there was tremendous camaraderie among David's colleagues, and they did honor the blackout, which, which was great. Um, one of David's colleagues named Michael Moss actually took down our wedding announcement from the website, because when you Google David, this, this announcement in a very small paper in York County, Maine, our, our wedding announcement would come up. And um, from that, you know, they would have been able to get the names of all of our relatives, where they lived, what they did for a living. Um, so I'm tremendously grateful that he did that. He also monitored the Wikipedia page um, because there were a few bloggers that tried to uh, report the story um, and update the Wikipedia page to say he'd been kidnapped. So um, just on the privacy issue, I really believe it was the right thing to do. Um, as his wife, I, I fought for that. Um, but I didn't take it lightly. We, we revisited that decision every week um, throughout the captivity. Um, as I said, this was a really steep learning curve for me. 
And um, I knew a little bit about the region from David's reporting and, um, you know, from some of the people I'd met through him. Uh, early on, I had access to his email. I had his password. So I went into his account and um, we had met with Ahmed Rashid in Pakistan when we visited. So I contacted him. Um, he told me it was a good idea to keep it private. Uh, he warned me about some of the intelligence agencies and perhaps the connection to the Haqqanis. Um, I also talked to a gentleman named Marin Stromecki, who actually called me up. Um, he was a a Bush administration official and an expert on Afghanistan and he had contacts in the Afghan government and he sort of counseled me through the early weeks he tried to think of you know what we could do who I could talk to um, in Afghanistan or Pakistan I was advised by everybody not to not to try to get in touch with Karzai um, <laughs> And in fact, throughout our case, um, there were a lot of sort of spoof uh, deals presented to us, and many of them stated that a deal could be had through Karzai or one of his relatives, and um, we we ignored those. <laughs> um, I also talked to Zal Halilzad, who he gave me good advice. He was like, you know, you really need a, a point of contact in the United States in the government. And he suggested that it be Richard Holbrook or Hillary Clinton. The new administration was not yet in office. Um, but uh, when they did come into power, um, Holbrook was was very proactive. Um, he arranged further down the line, he arranged for me to meet with ISI officials. Um, I think he, he more than anybody did, did a lot for our case. He um, pressured officials at the ISI to try to pressure the Haqqanis. There was a sense that perhaps some of the Haqqanis were assets of the ISI. I, we didn't know if that was true or not, but that um, maybe the ISI would either be able to affect a release or at least tell the Haqqanis to continue to talk to the family and strike some sort of deal. Um, I met with a very senior ISI official in D.C. in May, and this was about six months into David's captivity, um, and he sat down with me, my brother-in-law, and David's mother, and he, he would not refer to the Haqqanis by name. Um, he just referred to them as, you know, these are despicable people, and um, we don't talk to them directly. Occasionally, we have messages come in through emissaries and whatnot, and he did tell me that um, you know, he was very surprised that up until May, they had assumed, they had, you know, known that David was in Afghanistan, and he'd been informed by, um, I think, by our intelligence agencies <laughs> that David was indeed in Pakistan, and he seemed very surprised about that. Um, we had phone calls early on in the captivity that traced back to Pakistan, so uh, we felt he was there all along. Um, let me see. Uh, the other thing he had mentioned to me, this official, was that the Haqqanis were willing to talk to the ISI about David, but only after the ISI paid for, um, this was gruesome, the dead body of the Polish hostage, Piotr Stanzak, who had, who had been executed while David was in captivity. And um, I think at that point, that was a real low point for me, just realizing um, how gruesome our situation was, how grim. Um, toward the end of the captivity as well, I met with a very senior U.S. official and I sort of assumed all throughout that I wasn't getting much information from the government because they had some sort of secret plan and, and um, you know, they didn't want to give me information and whatnot. Uh, but really, I, I think, um, you know, the FBI is really a, um, an information gathering agency and, and they gathered a lot of information off our case. Um, I recorded all my phone calls and gave them recordings. Um, but uh, the senior U.S. military official said to me that, you know, they didn't know where David was, um, that anybody who told me they thought they had a fix on his location, it wasn't true. The U.S. military didn't know where he was. Um, they knew he was in Miram Shah, but they, it, it was like a 20 square mile area they thought he might be in. They didn't know which house or anything like that. Um, the whole experience, you know, there were so many different entities we dealt with as a family. We dealt with the New York Times, uh, the FBI, the State Department, U.S. and Pakistani officials. Um, I actually also uh, had a bit of help from a gentleman by the name of Michael Semple, who heads a foundation now named Talk for Peace. Um, he believes that you can negotiate with the Taliban. He tried to, I, I tried everything throughout this. He tried to help me get a hold of, um, of a mullah that was close to the Haqqani family. Um, and through one of David's Afghan colleagues, I sent in 
a plea for his release. Um, you know, I had asked his Afghan colleagues what would a Pashto woman do, thinking, you know, she'd be culturally sensitive or whatnot. And he had typed up, um, or actually handwritten a note uh, in Pashto stating, you know, my husband is my veil, he's my honor, please return him to me. Uh, so that went into the mullah. Um, I don't think it had much of an impact. Uh, months later, I was also advised to make a video of myself um, because I had received video footage of David and his fellow captors um, for communications, actually, um, in the course of seven and a half months. And I, you know, put on a headscarf and um, just tried to establish that the family was the point of contact. Please start calling us again. Um, his captors would go silent for weeks at a time. And the silence was uh, was just the worst thing. You know, the imagination took over when things were silent. Um, I tried to be proactive throughout and do everything I could for David. Um, I, you know, in the end, I sort of thought maybe doing less would have been better. I didn't know um, the impact of reaching out to US officials if that actually raised his value or not. Um, in the end, it came in handy when we had to get him flown out of Pakistan. Um, I was able to contact Holbrook and um, Hillary Clinton and say that David's on a scout base in Mirren Shah. Can you please make sure that he gets out of there? And they contacted the Pakistani officials, and um, and he's home today <laughs> because of that. Um, so that's a lot of information, but that's sort of a snippet of my side of the story. So that is uh, hugely compelling. Um, I want to take my privilege to just ask a few questions before we invite the audience in. And I want to just to tease out a few of the uh, an eclectic list of themes that came up in each of your remarks. One, David, you referred to, um, and, and Kristen, you would have been involved in this argument as well, the attempt to persuade your captors that as a journalist you should not be uh, held and that you should not be treated as a target. You have described in other settings that I've, where I've listened to you, the deep ideological divide between your captors and yourself, the, the kind of distorted view of uh, the world that they possessed. But you must have engaged in serious conversations about journalists. Um, in what way did they justify holding you as a non-combatant uh, professional witness what was how far did that discussion ever get um, they they simply said I mean it was more sophisticated than this but the basic point was you are an American citizen and you are therefore guilty of the crimes of the American government uh, one uh, Hakani commander was very clever he tried to ask me um, if I had voted in the election and I I, um, um, I misstated I lied to him I said I had not voted um, but it seemed to be like if I had somehow participated in the system, I would then be guilty. Um, and I, I had another commander say that that the the Taliban were an enemy of the New York Times because the New York Times supported secularism, and secularism was the enemy of the Taliban. So it, it just you know it was it was just disturbing how I felt I had some neutrality when I was detained by the Serbs in Bosnia 13 years earlier. But compared to Afghanistan, it was, you know, you're fair game because you're an American citizen. Being a journalist doesn't matter. And um, I think, uh, Kristen, this may be more something that you had direct experience of and, and David may be interpreting it after the fact. You, you referred to the effort to communicate through the ISI or to try to parse the relationship between the ISI and the Haqqanis. And, of course, in in uh, analysis of the region and of the conundrums in Pakistan and Afghanistan, the question of the relationship between the Pakistani state and the Haqqanis often comes up. Can you draw out any insights about what you learned or what remains to you a mystery about the nature of that relationship? Yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest mystery is, um, you know, Holbrook was very proactive in, in going to the ISI, and, and I do believe he did this, and, you know, holding their feet to the fire, make sure David Rode gets out alive and do everything you can. Um, it's unclear to me as to whether or not the ISI, you know, didn't do anything, they didn't care, um, or if they did try to help but had no influence. Um, that's um, 
and perhaps people have thoughts on that. Uh, but that that's sort of what I gleaned from it. It was really a murky world. Um, as I said, they wouldn't refer to the Haqqanis by name. Uh, but when I met with U.S. intelligence officials, um, I was told that, uh, that Jalal al-Din had been an asset and perhaps Siraj was as well. Mm. And Siraj had control of David. Did you reach any conclusions about that, David? Um, I... Uh, I never, I mean, to be fair to the ISI, I never met any ISI officials when I was in captivity. Um, and I never, you know, the the Haqqanis never sort of professed their allegiance to the ISI. There, there were odd things. One um, one of my guards was told to go kidnap an Indian engineer. Um, but And I'm just trying to be fair and impartial here, and that's an empirical fact. But, you know, you could, the conjecture could be that's part of a pattern of trying to sort of curry the favor of the ISI. Well, how, how should we understand the two uh, bits of evidence that you brought forward? One, this um, obvious comfort that the Haqqanis felt in proximity to elements of the Pakistani security forces in Miran Shah, and on the other hand, encounters uh, and even calls to, arm, calls to arms against the Pakistani army and and deep anger embedded in some of the militias that you were around toward the Pakistani state. Is it the case that we should understand that they are both aligned with and in revolutionary violence against the Pakistani state <laughs> simultaneously? Is that, um, I mean, That's not implausible, but is that what you interpreted? The, the, the anecdote where they, they decide that the Pakistani Taliban will fight the Pakistani army if they come into Miran Shah, I think that showed, to me, the Haqqanis are very clever, and they're sort of playing all sides of this. And so they maintain their sort of truce with the Pakistani army. They just carry out attacks over the border inside Afghanistan. But at the same time, uh, my experience in South Waziristan showed that the Haqqanis are working very closely with the Pakistani Taliban. And um, I, I would, you know, if, if the ISI um, and the Haqqanis are, you know, um, completely uh, in bed together and, you know, and the ISI could frankly like deliver a peace agreement involving the Haqqanis and that would end some of the bloodshed, maybe that would be a good thing. My bigger fear is that even the ISI overestimates its ability to deliver the Haqqanis, that the, they're basically playing it from every side. They're getting some funding from the Gulf. They get a good deal of money from Timber and other operations in Afghanistan. Um, and I, you know, their father did this very effectively in the 80s, as you've written about. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is hard to understand, but it's, it does seem like they, they play all sides. Yeah. And there is a truce, though, clearly. So just a, a couple more questions for me, and we'll open it up. Um, Kristen, back to you. I don't suppose you had thought about this um, at all before you got that first telephone call, and in many ways the answer to the question I'm going to ask is in the book, is in the fullness of the book. Mm -hmm. But with the distance of even being on the book tour, because sometimes when you have to step back and interpret your own writing, you rediscover what it was you thought you thought. Yeah. What lessons have you derived about the experience of managing a kidnapping? It's, it's yeah. more art than science, I think, especially yes. in an ideological setting yeah. such as a war and not outside yeah. of a marketplace like it sometimes occurs in Latin America. It, so have you inculcated um, some rules of thumb or some hard lessons about things you were um, convinced about? It's tough because I think every case is different, and hindsight's twenty twenty. And in writing the book, you know, there were so many moments where I looked at things we had done and thought, oh, gee, that was maybe that was a mistake to be talking to government officials. Maybe it raised his value. Um, but in the end, it really helped. Uh, it was very confusing to be dealing with so many different sort of high-powered entities. Um, you know, by that, I mean the FBI, you know, our government, um, CIA behind the scenes, um, the New York Times, private security contractors. We actually hired private security contractors uh, because the FBI couldn't directly negotiate. And um, we wanted a, a party there to represent our family that would not be conflicted if we had to entertain the idea of paying ransom. And in fact, um, I had to take calls and, and appear to be willing to do that. Fortunately, we never had to. But to keep a conversation going, we had to discuss the idea of paying for his release um, with money and prisoners, though. So um, I would say, I. Uh, you know, in a way, like fewer cooks in the kitchen, the better. 
Um, and in fact, I think in a lot of instances with security companies, they'll very often assign an advocate to a family um, to kind of go over all the decisions to be made with the family. Of course, you, you don't really have tremendous amounts of time to, um, it's weird, you, you know, it was very much a waiting process, waiting to hear about David, um, but there wasn't a lot of time to make decisions when there actually was communication. So that was tricky. Um, but I would say I would streamline it. Um, we were actually assigned an advocate, but you know, later in the case in May. Mm. Um, so I think um, it, you know, we're actually working with Committee to Protect Journalists to talk a little bit about our experience and this, the mistakes we made. Um, I would say having an advocate, having a point person in the family. Um, we had myself and David's brother. I actually think that worked out well because he was able to deal with updating the family. Um, we pretty much agreed on what we wanted done so we didn't conflict there. And it was totally exhausting. Um, you know, seven and a half months living with the thought that he could be killed at any moment. So we were each able to sort of step in for the other uh, when the other was exhausted. But it's really, um, it's just such a quagmire and there are unsavory characters on every side of, of mm. this kind of situation. Mm. Um, you know, this is gonna sound very simplistic, uh, but I think following your gut um, and that is what I did in terms of keeping the case private. Um, and uh, in retrospect, I think my gut reactions to things were correct. We fell into the problem of overthinking everything, um, trying to be culturally sensitive, um, just having too many people, you know, initially being afraid to give opinions and then combating with each other. Um, Lee and I actually dealt with, you know, having to. Um, police the <laughs> the security team and the FBI or you know if the organizations were at odds with each other and based on people's backgrounds um, you know there was a real bias um, as a family you're the only people that don't have to worry about setting a precedent um, so I think uh, you know really having the family following what the family desires is, is best that, that's uh, very compelling and respecting just to stay on the subject of, of the kidnapping itself, respecting that you never really confronted a practical choice about ransom. Never, there was never and, any appealing yeah, choice. Yeah, <laughs> respecting that you didn't, but also on the assumption that there's no universal moral law about the payment of ransom in circumstances right. like this. It's situational and so forth. You could, you could from a, uh, the, the safety of distance, say that there was sort of a marketplace failure here because they Absolutely. did have somebody of value and they were not able to figure out how to bring that transaction to a successful close. Yeah. Why? Why Why did they fail yeah. to realize the value well, of actually, their... Just one point. On our end, it was very difficult to know sort of what we might be able to settle this case for if we were to get into money amounts. Um, there was there was no real hard evidence to look at because people often won't report it or they won't share the information. So um, that, was, that was really tough. I, in terms of my captors and what they expected, I mean, I, I made a mistake early on in the kidnapping. On the second night, uh, our um, captors announced that an Al Jazeera film crew was coming and a group of Arab militants and that the three of us were going to be decapitated on film. Um, I, you know, said that uh, we were worth more alive than dead. And they said, well, what can we get for you? And so I said, money and prisoners. Um, there had been past cases. Um, an Italian journalist, Daniel Nastrogiacomo, had been released for five Taliban prisoners. Uh, and more recently, there had been um, a group of Korean missionaries released. And no one knew the amount, but reportedly for millions of dollars. So I said, money and prisoners. And then they said, well, how much money? And I uh, blurted out millions. Um, you know, that was a mistake. Um, and the, it raised their expectations. Um, what they did, though, I mean, um, uh, and then I, and to be honest, I also told them that I had done this reporting in Srebrenica in Bosnia, and I had, I was an independent journalist, actually back to your question about, you know, uh, journalists, and, you know, I had helped, written stories that had helped expose um, the deaths of 8,000 Bosnian Muslims, and, and I told them I was arrested by Christian fundamentalists, which is essentially true in terms of Serb nationalists, and they just didn't care. They said, well, that just means you're worth more money. Um, and I, I had thought that might help me if I was ever in a difficult situation with the Taliban. Um, uh, their initial demands were $25 million, 15 prisoners from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. They seemed determined to get more prisoners than um, had occurred in the, in the Italian journalist case. Uh, 
Um, and, you know, their demands were always sort of insanely high. When we escaped, the demand was $8 million and four prisoners. Um, there was a French aid worker who had been kidnapped just before me that was freed. They claimed the French government had paid $38 million for his release. Um, I think that number is not true, and it's, it's high. But one of the things we discovered is that there's no coordinated approach to kidnapping among different countries, and some European governments do pay. Um, the American government, you know, did not pay in my case and does not pay. They didn't release any prisoners. Um, and as far as we can tell, like, the British and Canadian governments don't pay either. Um, the problem is kidnappers don't believe it. You know, they think everyone pays and that they just had to wait out the U.S. government. Hmm. Yeah. And so one last question uh, for you, David, uh, in your eyewitness um, analytical capacity. You referred to uh, Uzbeks who are, I guess, among foreigners in the border region the most um, conspicuous. There are um, meant to be about 100 al-Qaeda foreign nationals in the same general region of the Waziristans. There's a couple of high-value uh, individuals who have been at large for a long time now uh, who are thought maybe to be or have at least at times been in that area, Miran Shah, would certainly be a logical place um, for them to pass through. What did you uh, interpolate, if anything, about the presence of foreign nationals, Arabs, Uzbeks, leadership of al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda itself? Did it ever even surface as an entity in your experience? Um, there was no, um, there was always talk that both in the main bazaar in Miran Shah and the main bazaar in McKean, that there were militants walking around, and that would specifically be primarily Uzbeks, but also Arabs. Um, and they felt very much at home in, at those, in those places. But in terms of senior al-Qaeda members, uh, there was no, I mean, I had no interaction, never heard of anybody being in the area necessarily. My guards did refer to Osama bin Laden as Sheikh Osama and seemed to, you know, really um, have great respect for him. Um, but it's, you know, it's, there are these walled compounds, the traditional Pashtun houses. Um, you know, it is very difficult to trace people in that area. And, um, you know, as this U.S. government official told Kristen, they really didn't know where I was. And um, for a variety of reasons, you know, uh, they're able to hide in that area. Um, and it's very difficult to find people. Great. All right. Well, let's take some questions from the audience. There's a woman there on the aisle and start there. Uh, Mary Ann McGrail, an attorney in D.C. Ms. Uh, Mulvihill, uh, I read your piece in Vogue, which I enjoyed, and I was very struck by the fact that you observed that you seem to know more about the situation in Afghanistan and Pakistan than FBI, which yes, leads me yes. to the FBI did, which <laughs> leads me to my question for both of you. Mr. Rode, were you debriefed? by the FBI when you got back, and how comfortable did you feel sharing what you had learned with FBI or any other American intelligence agency? Um, I, I, did, uh, I did talk to them. I, I spoke, I mean, it was a decision, a personal decision I had to make, and I essentially saw myself as a crime victim and felt that as a crime victim, um, you know, it would be appropriate to describe uh, what I had been through and experienced and seen. Um, so that's the short answer to the question, if you want to talk okay, about the sorry. FBI's. Um, in uh, terms of having more information than the FBI, very early on we met with local case agents um, in, in, actually it was New Hampshire, because David's brother was the point of contact and that's where he lived, so it was actually Massachusetts. Um, so they knew very little, um, or they appeared to know very little, and I found with with the people in New York, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, um, they were much more sort of aware of things. But with the FBI, you know, their whole tactic is to sort of neither confirm nor deny and seem like almost play dumb at times. I mean, that my mother was staying with me throughout, and she's like, are these guys dumb or just pretending? <laughs> and I think a lot of it was an act, too, um, because in the end, I, I actually do think they, they had a sense of where David was and whatnot. Um, but... Uh, Early on, um, when the New York Times Bureau was sort of fielding the calls, their local reporters there did a lot of research in terms of who had David. Um, they actually figured out that the commander he went to meet was the same person that kidnapped him. And I would receive these um, lengthy updates from the Times office in Kabul. And this is a kind of a funny little caveat. Um, 
the FBI agents in New York would ask me if I would please forward them on to them because when information, they would get the same reports from Kabul, but it had to clear um, their security clearance, and it took 12 hours. So I had information 12 hours before they did, and um, that didn't give me a lot of hope in the beginning. <laughs> um, but I will say, you know, they were kind of in the background throughout our case, um, and there when, when I went to meet David and whatnot, and um, in retrospect, um, you know, those early hours when they sort of told me what to expect and their negotiation team sort of training me to take calls, um, I, that was, uh, I, I will always be grateful for that. Um, I do know they gathered a lot of information off our case, so, um, but, but really they're the only people that step in and try to show you the way forwards. Um, so. uh, yes, right next to you there, Andrew, and then we'll come over on this side and come up. Uh, a guy with the Pakistani American Leadership Center. I think at one point, uh, Mr. Road, you mentioned that it seemed like the Haqqanis wanted direct talks with the U.S. What would they want to talk to the U.S. about, given that they're, it seems like they're based in Pakistan? What would those direct talks entail? Would it be about drone strikes? Would it be about pulling out of Afghanistan? And what would they hope to get out of those negotiations? I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. And I, you know, and, and their demands in my case were sort of so ridiculous uh, that I, I don't know. I'm not trying to – I mean, I'm just being honest with you. That was my, my sort of personal experience. Um, my captors believe that um, um, uh, that the three Somali pirates who were shot by American snipers um, after they kidnapped an American sea captain, um, that that never occurred. Uh, the Haqqani commanders thought that the U.S. had secretly paid a $25 million ransom. Um, the, the other Haqqani fighters I live with believe that a necktie was a secret symbol of Christianity. Um, they were sort of absolutely convinced um, that all Westerners were hedonists um, and that uh, they asked me if, you know, is it true that all Christians want to live a thousand years? Um, so they had this very kind of warped perspective on the outside world. Um, at one point when I was in captivity, um, uh, they, there was an attack on an immigration office in upstate New York. Um, a gunman shot about, I believe, 16 people. Um, that was when we were in McKean. Uh, Baitullah Massoud took uh, credit for that attack. And um, there was a report, and everyone was very excited and firing their Kalashnikovs in the air um, because they had been told that, that uh, Mujahideen had infiltrated the United States and carried out the attack. Later on the day, there was a broadcast that the gunman was actually Vietnamese, and the Haqqani guards that were with me asked me, they were sort of confused, and they said, well, but are, are Vietnamese people Muslims? And they, they really had, uh, and, I, and it was not fair. I mean, they're they sort of very brainwashed, and, and they lived in this very cloistered world, but they had a very distorted view of the outside world and of my importance and, and sort of what they could get from me. Um, so I, the point is I can't answer your question directly, but their demands in my case were just um, astronomical. It's right behind you there, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, I'm Leon. Weintraub University, Wisconsin. Ms. Smallville, you mentioned early on that the FBI identified themselves as having the lead in the case. But yes, you also mentioned you spoke to Mr. Holbrook, Secretary Hilton, Secretary, Secretary uh, Clinton, excuse me. I wonder if you could offer some comments on the ability of these agencies and other government agencies, perhaps the Department of Defense, I don't know, mm -hmm. to work together. We're often to display that uh, as the U.S. government when interagency competition rears its head, it's an ugly world out there. I'm wondering if you might offer a few comments on that. Um, I think there was definitely a sense of competition between the agencies. And, you know, I met with so many individuals who were impassioned and willing to help, but there was no coordination of information. You know, it, there was definitely competition between the CIA and the FBI. Um, Holbrook actually tried to, to be able to wrangle both sides and, and, and give me what information he could. But um, overall, you know, the government is very clunky. And um, that was absolutely our experience, yeah, unfortunately. Okay, in the next row there, the gentleman there with the stand up. Um, uh, Pratap Chatterjee, uh, David, I know that uh, I'm really looking forward to reading both of your book. I know that when you originally went there, you wanted to look into some of the history of the U.S. involvement. And I'm, I'm just wondering how much, uh, I know you haven't been able to get to a lot of it in this book, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about what your plans are for your future writing. I know this is normally the question at the end of the <laughs> session. But also, since I know that you were looking into police training, you've done some really good reporting from Iraq, I'm wondering, 
b both in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, in, in your short amount of time in Pakistan, if you got any sense of the U.S. involvement in training uh, in Pakistan, we've been reading a bit in the papers and now from WikiLeaks about the U.S. role in training uh, in the tribal areas and, in fact, going beyond that. Uh, so any, anything you learned or any comments about uh, the, the training and the police? Um, Pratap's an old friend, and I, I would have planted that question if I'd known he was going to be here. Um, I, uh, I, I, my own writing, I'm not sure actually what comes next. I, my days as a war correspondent are over. I'm, my wife's been through enough. I won't be going back to covering wars anymore. Um, I, I don't know much about what's going on in terms of training in Pakistan. I mean, there's been very small um, efforts by the State Department to try to strengthen Pakistani police forces. One of the frustrations in terms of the $2 billion a year that the U.S. is giving to the, mil the Pakistani military is that uh, some of that money is not getting to these frontline frontier corps units that are actually doing the fighting. Um, they're very poorly equipped, and I think there's, there's been some frustration with that. Um, but I, I don't know much in terms of new details about how that's going. And, and as you've written about also, the police training after in Afghanistan is sort of was very um, fits and starts. Initially, it was a two-week training program run by DynCorp International, um, and after two weeks, they would be declared trained um, Afghan police officers. Um, it's much more serious now, um, and it's a much more serious effort in Afghanistan. But as you know, there was, you know, it was really a sort of a paltry effort through the first five or six years. It's a woman right to hear with the hat on. Oh, hi, hi, David and Kristen. My name is Shaquille Kalji, and uh, I am. Um, um, I d you don't know me, but I'm here specifically to attend this, but to thank you so much for enlisting our NGO in your book. I'm dying to read the book. Um, and it's Afghans for Tomorrow. I'm sure you remember that. Yeah. And also wanted to say that I'm glad you kept your last name when you made a name. I have to. I've been punished <laughs> and mentioned that. Um, I'm sure you mentioned in the book, but can you just briefly talk about your personal experience and what went through your mind and how much of experiences you've drawn from your captivity in Bosnia and, and during your, your experiences in Afghanistan? Um, Thank you. Sure. And I just want to, I, I, I kind of want to apologize on the question about the Haqqanis and negotiation. Um, you know, my experience was that I, I had an incredible time in South Asia. Um, I was the bureau chief in New Delhi from 2002 to 2005. I kept going back once I had moved back to New York and joined the Papers Investigative Unit. And, you know, um, one of the most basic things was how different my captors were from the vast majority of Afghans and Pakistanis I'd met who were just wonderful people that wanted sort of secure existences and good futures for their children. And, and it was, you know, sort of heartbreaking to me. And we, we both wrote this book um, not to kind of demonize this region. That's the last thing we want to do. And, and, and um, you know, personally, it was, it was um, very moving for me when we escaped that there was um, this Pakistani army captain who led us on the base. Um, and the first thing he did was sort of apologize to me um, as a Pakistani and as a Pashtun. Um, I had all these um, Afghan and Pakistani journalists who had been incredible friends for years, you know, that helped Kristen tremendously and apologized to me. And, um, you know, it was, it was remembering um, that Pakistan and that uh, Afghanistan that kind of kept me going personally day to day. And I don't want to sound like too negative or too hopeless in my comments here today. Um, you know, I think peace and prosperity in the region is possible. Great. So this is a gentleman and then here and then we'll come down the other side. Hi, I'm Tony Drexler. I'm a health consultant just back from Kabul. And um, there, I'd like to ask uh, about the attitude of the Haqqanis towards Indians. Uh, there's a lot of feeling going around that they're out hunting Indians in the UN. And I'd just like to know if you had any um, insight into that. Great. Um, again, I don't want to overstate my experience. I was spending a lot of time with the young men in their 20s who were my guards. Um, they watched a lot of these DVDs, and the DVDs would, would show images of atrocities carried out in Kashmir, in Chechnya, in Iraq, you know, in Afghanistan, and in Pakistan itself. And I lived um, with my guards through, you know, the Israeli attack on Gaza. And there was, and, and literally there was one video I remember which would flash uh, 
flags on the screen of this kind of international alliance against uh, the UMA. Um, and it was the American flag, the British flag, the UN flag, and the Indian flag. And so, you know, they are brainwashed into thinking that, you know, it's a religious war and that, you know, India is part of it. Um, and, and that's what I saw them watching all the time. And in terms of specific references to Indians, there was only that one case of and, and again, to his credit, that guard um, actually refused to go carry out the kidnapping of an Indian engineer. Um, he said, this is a person who's come to help Afghanistan, and I think it's wrong to go kidnap him. So uh, there are little glimmers here of, uh, of what's happening, and, and it's, what's so dark and cynical is the level of brainwashing. Um, it was just tragic. Yes, sir, in the front. Ravi Khanna, VOA TV. Now that you have seen the ground realities in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the border, and you know President Obama is going to reassess his strategy in this month, later this month. What advice do you, you what suggestions you can have for him? Um, <laughs> WikiLeaks has made this easy for me. Um, I, uh, I mean, I'm struck by, uh, you know, one of the cables, it's a cable by Ann Patterson, the American ambassador, and this is uh, my, I, I mean, I am, you know, I, as Steve said, I escaped 17 months ago, and it's, it's, on a personal level, it's deeply disappointing that North Waziristan remains completely under Taliban control. Um, and, and, you know, it's a very dangerous thing for most of all for Pakistan. It's Pakistanis that are going to be killed um, from plots uh, coming out of there. But I agree with uh, Ambassador um, Patterson's uh, description in this one cable, um, which is that what's really going on here is the India-Pakistan rivalry is playing out um, in Afghanistan and the tribal areas. And she wrote justified or not increased Indian investment in trade with and development support to the Afghan government, which the U.S. government has encouraged, causes Pakistan to embrace Taliban groups all the more closely. And later on in the cable, she says, no amount of money will sever that link. And I would agree that, you know, this, this tensions between India and Pakistan are, have a large role in what's destabilizing Afghanistan. And, you know, it's been talked about endlessly. How you solve it, I don't know. But reducing India-Pakistan tensions is the key to stabilizing the region. And, and everybody's got to make sacrifices and compromise, I, I think, to make that happen. Great. So on this side, there's a woman there. And then I'll come back to you. Hi, I'm Alex Bloom. I'm at Pax Mundial. And uh, I was wondering, you talked a little bit of earlier about uh, lessons learned from managing your kidnappers. And I was wondering if there's any lessons learned regarding avoiding being kidnapped for journalists working in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and other NGOs? Um, I went to this interview too quickly. Um, I mean, I did know his name. I had his phone number. I knew the village we were meeting him. I did meet with this journalist who had met with him twice. Um, I think I should have just waited um, um, before going. Uh, don't tell your captors you can get millions of dollars. Um, <laughs> that would be a pretty simple one. Um, I think they kept him alive in the early minutes. I, I do, so I don't know that it was <laughs> You see how lucky I am? <laughs> um, and we're working with the CPJ to try to figure out um, guidelines for families and then also for journalists about, you know, how to avoid kidnappings. And it's sad. I, I do tell this to young journalists, like, that this was just a total, you know, catastrophe for my family and that, you know, they should just – you know, unfortunately, for you know, you should only go to these kind of areas where you're working with, and you know, you've got the full backing of a major news organization that has staff fixers that really know the area, um, and it's it's very dangerous for freelancers in particular that go because you know the New York Times was just outstanding in supporting us, and freelancers don't necessarily have that, um, and we we are just not we're not considered neutral. You know, people, aid workers are obviously not considered neutral. You're, you're considered fair game, and you unfortunately have to think that way all the time. I would add one thing, that uh, if you are a journalist, that you talk to your family about, you know, potential kidnapping, what you would want done. I mean, knowing that you can't predict everything ahead of time. Um, in David's research for CPJ, he's found that a lot of the, the British news organizations do do that. Reporters fill out a questionnaire, sort of what they would want done, who they would want to be the point person. Um, and I think, you know, that would have, we were constantly trying to weigh, in addition to preserving his life, what would David also want us to do? What would be the least traumatic way, <laughs> um, you know, for this to end? Um, would we have wanted a raid to be carried out, you know, if that was possible? Um, all those kinds of things are good things to talk about in advance, you know, knowing that you're going to have to make decisions on the fly anyway, 
but just some preparation. We had talked about what to do you know, if he died, <laughs> um, what to do if he was injured, but we didn't ever specifically talk about kidnapping. In the front row here. Thanks. Hi, Kristen. Um, Mark Solomon. Quick question. What types of information do you think would have been useful to you from a government standpoint that you didn't get, that you thought would have been helpful to help you manage the case? Um, it would have been, well, we, we figured out who he was with, number one, who's, who was holding him. Um, it would have been useful to know sort of what most other cases had settled for, um, I think. Uh, also, just that I would have liked to have known earlier on that they really had no idea where he was, you know. Um, I, when I would come to D.C., officials would contact me and want to meet, and they would tell me I would be getting an update. But really, they would be asking me for information, um, and I found that completely annoying <laughs> and, and really frustrating. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, just a sense of, of how these things play out. And, and, and to their credit, the FBI does sort of prep you. Um, but every case is different. Um, I, I think just perhaps more information sharing between governments um, and how they handle kidnappings and, um, you know, a coordinated effort and agreement on how they should be handled. Yeah. They, um, the, we've been, American officials told us that European officials won't tell them how much they paid. They, they really don't know. So it wasn't like the government knew what other cases had settled for and didn't tell us. They simply, you know, there's just no coordination between governments on this. Gentleman there. Steven Anderson, thank you. Uh, you ref you've, you've talked a little bit about the WikiLeaks. First question is, the, has there been anything to date in the WikiLeaks that reflects either directly on your case, or number two, is there anything in the WikiLeaks that has enriched your understanding of what happened to you or has, uh, has filled out the story a little bit more for you? Um, there was a couple cables that referred to me. Uh, there really wasn't anything uh, major in them. They referred to um, uh, a tape that the Taliban wanted Al Jazeera to play uh, that they had made of me. It was the snow video where they took us off to the snowy hillside, um, and Al Jazeera, you know, didn't didn't play it at the request of the New York Times. It was and it was that was a cable out of Abu Dhabi or I'm sorry, it would have been Qatar, um, uh, and there was one other kind of standard. Um, another a press, a possible press report about me in Pakistan, but there wasn't anything revelatory in, um, in, that I, in WikiLeaks about my, other than that, about my case. David, could I ask you about this, uh, this story we were talking about before we came in, in that appeared in The Nation recently that described some of the aftermath of your kidnapping uh, or purported to on the basis of interviews with Afghans uh, who, who said they were familiar with what had gone down in terms of how the Haqqanis and the Quetishur and other elements interpreted the fact of your um, escape? Um, it was, thank you, I forgot about the story. Um, uh, it ran two or three weeks ago, um, and it, um, it ran in the nation, and a, a journalist named Aram Rostin had spoken to Afghan sources. And what he uh, learned from them, um, and it, it's very detailed, very credible, because the names of the, these Afghan sources had the correct names of all my guards and their relationships to the kidnappers and the Haqqanis. And he said that uh, this feud broke out after our escape, and immediately um, the, um, the Haqqanis said that the kidnapper himself, particularly his younger brother, who was our chief guard, had somehow secretly been paid a ransom by my family and that they had then let us escape and given us this rope and, and staged the whole thing. The guards themselves um, actually said that the Haqqanis had secretly been paid a ransom and that they must have been drugged, that their food must have been drugged, and that's the only way they could have remained asleep when we crept out of the room and escaped. Um, and they said it was the Haqqanis who had given us you know, the rope. Um, so there's this feud going on, and what happens is the Haqqanis takes two of these guards um, and they actually turn them over to the ISI. And um, uh, particularly the younger brother of my kidnapper, who was our main guard, he lived with us throughout the captivity, um, he was actually um, held by the ISI and tortured pretty badly. And they demanded to know whether he had, you know, basically cheated the Haqqanis out of money. Um, the ISI came to the conclusion that no ransom had been paid, uh, no one had been bribed, and that is true. And, and people question it all the time, but no ransom was paid and there were no, no guards were bribed. Um, and then... What the ISI did, though, um, was they simply released the guards instead of returning them over, turning them over to American officials. 
Um, all of this is in the Nation. Um, it ran maybe two weeks ago. Aram Rostin is the reporter who did the story. And it all fits. It's very credible in terms of what happened and, and the different players as far as I'm concerned. Yes, the gentleman has been waiting. My, Terry Sullivan. And Chris, I don't know if you recognize that name. We've talked several times. I was one of the uh, security contractors in Kabul working on David's case. And having been involved in several of these things, I really want to commend you on the way you handled it. Uh, we've dealt with other families and things like that. And, and you, uh, you really you, you went from the gut. You, you did what was right. Uh, you're very perceptive on the, uh, uh, the government agencies. Uh, they, they don't work together. It's difficult. Um, you know, as a contractor, I could go out and have an interview in a restaurant with somebody and come back, and as soon as I turned that information over to the FBI or the military, it became classified. Yeah. Then it went through a whole declassification process so that they could tell you. I mean, I know there's some controversy on bringing in a, a contractor on that, yeah. but I, I think in, in this case that hopefully we kept David safe long enough so that he could eventually get, yes. get out. And again, I just wanted to commend you on the, on the way you handled great everything. To meet you. I actually have never met him in person. I've talked to him on the phone <laughs> and had updates. So th thank you for coming today. <laughs> yeah, we talked almost every day with yes. a, a tele, a teleconference <laughs> with all the key players on this. Thank you, Terry. Um, thank you for the, uh, all the hours you spent yeah. in Kabul waiting for the Haqqanis to call. <laughs> <laughs> All right, seeing no more hand straining, I think we should uh, call it a call it a well done session. Thank you both for your candor and your insights. Appreciate it. And the book is called A Rope and a Prayer. <laughs>